dismay. Welcome to our Teens Cornerstone Connections lesson. Lesson number six, entitled, Unhappy Campers. With Brenda taking us through the mission story from our inter-European division. Of course, Grace is interpreting using sign language, soothing, melodious music from our wonderful orchestra, Amy on the violin, Sabira on the clarinet, and of course, our wonderful panelists. We have Ashley, Grace, Masati, and our wonderful teen teachers. And Steve, enjoy. Happy Sabbath, my name is Brenda and I'll be taking you through this week's mission. Before we start, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, thank you for this beautiful Sabbath morning and for bringing us here as we're about to study more about your word. As we learn from today's mission, may we learn something new that will give us hope and encourage us to continue spreading your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Today's mission comes again from the Inter-European Division and from Spain. Today's story come, uh, is about a guy called Remus. Remus is um, a man that um, lives in Spain with his wife and three children. He was a nurse and his wife was an architect. And by all appearances, they had everything they had, had ever wanted, but something was still missing in his life. Remus longed to, ab to be able to repeat the prayer of Jesus to his father, which comes from John 17, and it says, I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given to me. Remus wanted to glorify God's, God with his life, but how? This verse was talking about someone who'd finished their job on earth, while Remus felt like he hadn't really done anything for God's glory. He wondered if his mission would be similar of that of Jesus. When he proclaimed in the synagogue in Luke 4, 18, verse 19, and it says, um, when he proclaimed, um, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has appointed me to preach the gospel, the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim the liberty to the captives, and to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Remus reading from Matthew 28, 19, verse 20, and I like to remember this verse in a song, and it goes like this. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Then he read in Ellen White's book, Colliptural Ministry, the canvassing work properly conducted his missionary work of the highest order, found in page six. Ramos, and his, uh, Ramos decided to become a liter literature evangelist, and he wanted to become someone, in his words, who tried to sell books to people who didn't want to buy them. He decided, him and his family decided to move to Galicia, a highly secular region in Spain. Among a, among a population of nearly three million people and 500 Adventists, Remus started to sell Bibles and other, in, and other books, um, Adventist books in outdoor markets where you could find clothes, toys, and other books. People began to call him the Bible guy. In your own neighborhoods, do you have such a name? At, at the outdoor market, Remus would find vendors and start selling to them. He started selling to people who clearly did not have any interest to the word. There's something unusual about spreading the word of God in such places. He tells his, his family and other friends. There's a time he met a, a vendor who was selling secular books and he told him, let me sell you something that will change your life. The man clearly didn't want to engage, but he couldn't fend off um, Remus away from him. And after some time, he told him, there's something unusual about you. The man finally acknowledged. After many converse, conversations at the market, the man agreed to buy several other Adventist books and a Bible. After some time, he had read it at home with his family and asked Remus for Bible studies. He's, he gave his heart to Jesus a few months later, and today the man is trying to convince the rest of his family to give their hearts to him, to Jesus. He and Remus are friends, and whenever they meet, he calls out, Hey, it's the Bible guy. Is that a, sometimes when Remus would um, sell books, he, didn't, he would claim that God himself sold the books. Those are God's sales, not mine. 
He would randomly be walking with a bunch of Bibles and someone would say, is that a Bible? How much is it? Can I buy it? And in those times, God, Ramos uses that as testimony, saying, those aren't my sales, those are God's. In that case, Ramos didn't need to do anything to make the sales. He just had to leave his house and God sold the Bibles. At a time, a woman literally jumped from joy when she saw Ramos with the Bibles. And she, and she exclaimed with joy, I have been praying for a Bible. This is an answered prayer from God. Another time, Ramos traveled around 70 miles, which is 120 kilometers, to reach an outdoor market. To his joy, he sold many books that day. But in the, when the evening came, he realized he didn't have enough to cover the costs from back and forth from the market to his house. He wondered, was this trip really worth it? Yes, I sold books, but was it really worth the gasoline? And then an, an elderly man approached him around the age of 90 and asked him, do you have a Bible and can you explain the content of it? I have been really curious for basically all my life to know what this book is about. Remus spoke joyfully about Jesus and gifted the old man a Bible. The man broke down in tears, saying that this was the only thing he had been waiting before he was able to die. Ramos is happy to serve God in Spain, and he hopes to see that man in heaven one day. He believes that trip was worth it after all. He's happy to be known as the Bible guy. In your own neighborhoods, are you known as someone who spreads the word of God? Do people ever consider you the Bible guy, that one person they can come and ask for advice when it comes to godly matters? Spain has many cities and towns without the Seventh-day Adventist presence. And, think, and because of your 13th Sabbath offering th from three years ago to now, we have been able to sponsor Sanguta Adventist College to help train more people who will be able to spread the good news. Jesus is coming soon to the, country and to the other countries and beyond. Amen. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy day. Welcome to our lesson discussion this uh, evening. The title of the lesson is Unhappy Campus. We're in the second quarter of 2023, and what we've been discussing is the desert drama. And today we'll be looking at Unhappy Campus. And these are the experiences of the children of Israel that are found in the book of Exodus. And some of the key chapters that we'll be covering is Exodus chapter 15, up to chapter 18, and we'll also be reading from Patriarchs and Prophets, chapter 26, where the title is From the Red Sea to Sinai. Before we begin, I'd like to introduce the panelists who will be here with us today. I'll start from my left. Please introduce yourself. Happy Sabbath. My name is Grace Washeke, and I'm happy to be here today. Mm -hmm. uh, happy Sabbath, everyone. My name is Steve Mwebu, and I'm glad to be here today, this Sabbath. And I am Misati, Misati Nyambane. Thank you. Before we begin, I'd like to invite Misati to start us off with a word of prayer. So let's pray. We thank you, mighty Father, for the goodness that you have bestowed upon us and the greatness that you have showed upon us, O mighty Father, and the love that you have bestowed upon us. As we launch into this lesson, looking into the narrative of the Israelites whom are called by your name, please, Lord, may we find gems of knowledge and truth that will guide us. In Jesus' name we pray and we believe. Amen. So this word we have, we have the word trust. That is, and trust means many different things to many different people. And I'd like to ask you people what you understand by trust. However, I want you to tell me the most trustworthy profession. That is, which career, if someone is in, it requires them to have a lot of trust and you would actually be able to trust such a person. For me personally, I think that the world of medicine needs, you know, has a lot of trust in it because you have to trust this doctor or this surgeon, this specialist that you've gone to see, that he's going to do what is going to actually make you feel better or what could actually save your life. To me, I believe it's uh, the profession of engineering, uh, more specifically in architecture, whereby you find that the 
the people who create these huge buildings and to make it work, to make them work and to ensure that they do not crumble because it involves life and death. So I believe that uh, the profession of engineering is also one that requires trust and needs people who are trustworthy. For me, I think that the world of um, chemical engineering is, it needs a lot of trust because for the engineer to depend on the machine, he needs to have a metal that is not being eroded. That's all chemical engineering. For me to take medicine from, that is prescribed by the doctor, chemical engineer must have worked on it. The world of chemicals and safety and trustworthy are just combined. Nice. Uh I agree that medicine is a profession that needs a lot of trust because if you have to go for a surgery and you trust the doctor with your life, they give you anesthesia, you might not be sure you'll come back up. I also think the airline industry is actually something that involves a lot of trust. When I think about it, if you go into a plane, if anything happens in the sky, chances are high that you will die. So I actually think very many professions need a lot of trust. Yeah. And for myself, I would look at the pastoral work as a career that requires a lot of trust because you are dealing with people's minds, their spirituality. Since as I see it, there is no use for your money if your mind is not free. And that's why trust can be put as a firm reliance on someone's ability, character, and integrity. And that's exactly where, where we are in this lesson, where the Israelites are being tasked that Will they trust God or will they trust their own fabrications of their minds? I'd like Grace to take us through that. Maybe before we go to Grace, I'd like to give a short illustration that will segue into the story in a nice way. There's a story of a boy by the name Lance. And Lance had everything going in life for him. He could study and he passes his exams even without having to read. Then he had a girlfriend, which is a very good thing. He also had a car, which he got from his dad in the company that his dad owned. And everything just looked good. His looks were also okay. So he didn't have any freckles on his face. So maybe he just had good genes. Then suddenly things took a downturn. His girlfriend left him. He went and crashed the car that his dad had got him. His dad's business also failed, so he couldn't get another car. And also his grades in school really went down. And at that point he started asking, is God really trustworthy? And I'm just thinking, is it possible that this is how our faith is today? When things are going well, we actually trust in God. But when things start taking a downward turn, it's possible that we might lose our trust in him. And this takes us into the segment where we want to look at how is it that the Israelites did not trust God. So Grace, you can go ahead and tell us the story of the unhappy campers. Sure. So this week's lesson comes from the book of Exodus. It actually comes from a lot of different places. But this is basically the story of how the Israelites complained when they didn't have what they needed and how God provided for them. So we begin with how they lacked food in general. So the Israelites were in the desert. They had already crossed the Red Sea and gone through the whole Mara incident, and now they were complaining to Moses about food. Now they were telling him that back in Egypt, we used to sit around these huge pots that had meat in them, and we'd eat them till our stomachs would burst. But now you've brought us here to the desert, and you thought that there were no graves in Egypt? Did you want us to just come to the wilderness so that we could just die out here or something? Then Moses went to talk to the Lord about it, and he told him that, at the end of the day, like by the next day, they're going to have bread. And he went and told the Israelites this, that God would provide their needs. That evening, leave alone the next day, that evening, quails came and they flooded the campsite. So the Israelites had the meat that they had been desiring. Then when they woke up the next day, they found dew on the ground. And when it dried up, they found white flakes that covered the whole desert floor. So now they started asking themselves, what is this? And Moses told them that this is the bread that God has provided for you. 
Now, each of you is to take, how many is this? Each of you is to take an omer, and an omer is about two liters to last you an entire day. So the Israelites decided to call this manna because actually the Hebrew word for what is it is manhu. So that's where we get the word from. Then now we go from the bread and meat incident. Now we get to the water incident. They'd gone to the desert of sin and they had camped at Rephidim and they began to complain to Moses about water, even though they had seen God's miracle of providing them with food just a few days back. And Moses replied, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? And actually the NKJV version says, why do you tempt God? And as you can remember at what Jesus said when he was tempted by the devil, that it is wrong to tempt God. But instead of the Israelites listening to Moses and actually beginning to trust God, they, they continued complaining. And finally, Moses went to God and told him, Lord, what do you want me to do? These people want to stone me to death. But then God gave him instructions and told him to take his staff and go to the rock, which is at Horeb, and then strike that rock, and water would come out of it. Sounds, you know, impossible. I mean, you can't go strike a rock and have water come out of it. Mm -hmm. But when he did, water actually did gush out of it. Mm -hmm. And now we go just a little bit down, and we get to this time when Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, had come to visit him and saw that Moses had a lot in his hands, and apparently he didn't want any help. So he counseled him to actually get to get capable men and appoint them as officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. And Moses decide, decided to listen to what his father-in-law had to say, and no doubt this made things a whole lot easier for him. And now, with that in mind, we can go out of the story. So, now let's forget about the Israelites a bit, how they were feeling when it looked like God had forgotten them and not providing them with what they needed. How do you suppose God felt about the Israelites during all of this drama? You know, the way I understand it, the way I feel is that God felt and pissed off to some degree that for him he says, I am not a man that I should lie. So when God said, I will be there for you, I will provide for you, that is, and I think oftentimes we often forget that God, I think just taking ourselves at first is that you just tell someone, I'm going to do this for you. And God had shown so much compassion, so much mercy to them and had done so many great things to the point he was like, trust me just a bit more. And the thing is, we need not fear for the future if we remember God's presence in our past. I also get the sense of that uh, God was... Kind of was calm about the whole situation, and uh, the way he held, he handled the situation, he wasn't angry at the Israelites. He only just understood that they were going through a lot. They had just come from uh, a lot after crossing the Red Sea uh, and then staying in the wilderness, which is not an easy thing because it was a dry place. And so, therefore, I believe that God was, even though God yes was somewhat angry to some extent, somewhat pissed off. I believe it was also calm and understanding to the Israelites. And this actually leads me to the next question. So what picture of God do we see revealed in this story? You know, I think God is a father. You know, when you ask your dad for something, he just gives it to you. But at times you may say it so many times and you feel like I'm telling him and he's not doing anything about it. But he was trying to teach him the aspect of um, patience. You know, we like the Israelites, my mind complain, forgetting to cite God's blessings poured on us on previous accounts. They had been blessed, they had been delivered, but this moment they saw a challenge. And you know, Ellen White says that their food had not run out. They, had, they still had food for a month, but just to think that they were going to starve at some point, they were already doubting. Yeah. And also what I got is, he knows our needs. You don't have to tell him. Like there's this verse, it's in Matthew 6, 
but I can't remember the exact verse, that Jesus was telling the disciples and all those listening that don't worry about what you eat or what you wear or where you live. God knows you need these. And he already knows. And of course, he's going to provide them for you. He provides for the birds, even though they don't worry about it. And how much more valuable are we as humans, as we who are made in his image as compared to birds? Amen, amen. Now this leads us to... Oh. Go ahead, go ahead. So this leads us to the next question. The text records that the Israelites tested the Lord. Is this a good thing or a bad thing? I would see it that testing God is neither a good nor a bad thing because there are different ways to test God. And I see what the Israelites did is that they tested God in the wrong way. That is, if God has said something and we doubt him and we do the opposite and say, oh, God is so good, God cannot smite me because, ah, he's a good guy. You know, I think that's, that's testing God in the wrong way. When he says something, then we do the opposite and say, ah, he will not make good the consequences. While testing God in a good way would be that God says, test me, see that I am good by obeying my commandments. Mm. So when we obey God's commandments, we have tested him in essence. And when we disobey him, we also test him. Mm. But now we test him differently. Yeah. I could say that is not testing, but provoking. <laughs> because... In Malachi 3.10, mm -hmm. the Bible says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse, mm -hmm. and there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, mm -hmm. if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Now that is testing the Lord, because we are testing, testing the Lord to see that he is good. And blessed is us, the Lord promises blessings if we trust in mm -hmm. him. But what the Israelites were doing, they were provoking God. They're like, you know those people who say, if God exists, strike me now and I die. That's provoking God. Mm -hmm. You're not testing God. Gideon tested God, not provoked him. So I think there's a difference in all these things. Yeah. I actually think on that point that the Bible says in Psalm 34, 8, taste and see, not test, taste and see <laughs> that the <laughs> Lord is good. So I think we should actually taste and see that God is good. In fact, one of the temptations that Satan gave to Jesus was jump down from this place and the angels will go and catch you. And Jesus said, thou shalt not test, test the, the Lord. Lord your God. So God calls us to taste and see that he is good, not to test him. Okay, now this leads us to like the final set of questions. So great Moses on how he handled this whole drama that the Israelites caused. Great how he handled it as a leader. So as, as a leader, I see that Moses handled it in a very lovely way. Mm -hmm. Or here he was able to control his temper. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why it was necessary for God to take him through the wilderness for 40 years. Mm -hmm. In that he had to learn to be with sheep in order to endure sheepish people. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay. I'd give him a 10 yeah. if you were to ask me. Me too. Yeah, because when the Israelites complained, he cried to the Lord. He didn't start doing the things that he wanted to do. He went to God immediately. And you know, being a commander, being someone who was trained in the military, he, he knew how to command people, right? They turn right, left, you turn left. But you can imagine people who've never had any laws that govern them, and now they're complaining, grumbling. I'll just close my ears and walk. I also get to some extent that he was just calm about the situation. Mm -hmm. He was uh, more controlled about it. And when he talked, ab when he talked about it to God, he was, uh, he would talk about it to God in more of a diplomatic way, not complaining, not saying that this, they're doing this and that. Mm -hmm. So I believe he handled it very well. Mm. So did I. Okay, now the final question. What's the one big idea that emerges from this story? I think what emerges from this story is that God intends not that we worry ourselves with fear and anxiety for the future, but lean on his arm everlasting, availing for the Father will bear up with us and our cares. And also what I think emerges here is that the aspect of responsibility, mm -hmm. let's say when uh, you're in a, a point of leadership, just understand that there will be people who will 
question your methods, who will challenge you, and who will grumble about every single thing that pops up uh, about a situation. So the idea of taking responsibility and taking it calmly, the way Moses did, is a really good thing to take from this story. Yeah, and this brings us to the end of our little Bible story in terms of into the story and out of the story. And right now we're going to invite our lovely orchestra to play the hymn for today. I must tell Jesus. Amen. Jesus is all the world to me. I believe this was a hymn that Moses could sing when he was facing all the unhappy, company, unhappy campers in the wilderness. Can you imagine all the complaints that he had from the people? The overwhelming nature of the challenges of managing all this group of people that you've taken out into the wilderness, and then suddenly things are not going right. I believe Moses could only say, Jesus is all the world to me. Thank you, orchestra, for the lovely hymn that you have sung. I'd like us to go back to our lesson where we are still talking about the unhappy campers. And our key text today is from the book of Exodus, chapter 15, verse 26, which I'll read, where the Bible says, 
if thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and will do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. Misati, what does this verse tell us? So this verse right here gives us the evidence of God's goodness. And that God shows us that I place before you life and death. So what I see here is that God gives us decrees. And I'd like to start with the decrees that God gave about cleanliness. That is, if we observed pristine conditions of cleanliness, we would never get any diseases that come from cleanliness. That is, there would be no cholera. There would be no typhoid. And even when we come to the very law of God, that is when we observe to remember the Sabbath, the day, and to keep it holy, we prevent ourselves from becoming fatigued because we have dedicated a day out of our week to take a break. And at the same time, we will transcend to the second set of the laws, the laws that pertain to humanity. That if there, if there, is, no, if there is no sexual relation outside marriage, there can be no sexual transmitted diseases. In essence, so God is saying that when you, if you keep my dictates, you will not be fatigued, you won't have STDs, and you'll be clean, you won't have cholera, you won't have any of these issues. And I, I see the goodness of God right here. Amen, amen. I think when you think about it, when God says, I will put none of these diseases upon you. Last week's lesson talks about, talked about faith first. When God says, I will put none of these diseases, I'm just trying to think to myself, is God talking about cancer? Is he talking about uh, any of the things, prostate cancer, tonsillitis, asthma, any of the diseases that we are suffering from today? God is saying, if you keep my commandments, then you'll get none of these diseases. I think this is a really key thing that we need to take out from this because God has promised that he will heal us from any disease. In fact, we won't even get them. So let's hearken diligently to the commandments of God. And I'd like now to go to Ashley to actually give us more insight about what Ellen White wrote in Patrick's and Prophets chapter 26. It's titled From the Red Sea to Sinai. Ellen White had fascinating insights on this. Could you share them with us, Ashley? Yeah, you know, this, this brings us to the murmuring and the complaining of the Israelites, their unbelief. And you know, the Lord permitted, it says in the flashlight, that the Lord permitted difficulties to surround them, the supply of food to be cut short, that their hearts might turn to him who hath hitherto been their deliverer. If in their want they would call upon God, he would still grant them manifest tokens of his great love and care. He had promised that if they would obey his commandments, no disease would come upon them, and it was sinful disbelief and belief on their part to anticipate that they or their children might die of hunger. So then belief caused that the promises of the Lord were not to be fulfilled in their lives. They did not live to see the promises of the Lord fulfilled in their lives because of their unbelief. And, you know, it's a question to us what unbelief causes us not to benefit of the promises that the Lord has given. Amen. I believe when we look at the things that God has offered us, God is saying that do the experiences that seem like difficulties draw you away from me or bring you closer to me? God asks us that question. Do we trust him? Coming back to how we started on the what do you think section. Do we trust God in bad times? He gave an illustration of Lance. Do we trust God when things are only doing good, going good or when things are also bad? Steve, we'd like to look at some of the punchlines that were shared with us in the lesson today. There are several verses and I'd like to start with you. What are some of the verses that you picked that were interesting to you? Okay, one particular verse that uh, stood out to me was... Uh, it was coming from First Timothy, mm -hmm. chapter six, verse eight, and if I may read it, it says, "But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that." Mm. Um, contentment here stands out because it is a really, a really good aspect to have, a really good trait to have, especially when uh, you find yourself comparing 
to others. You see, like here the Israelites were comparing their lifestyle in Egypt to their lifestyle in the wilderness, knowing that circumstance, uh, not knowing that the circumstances are different and that things happen differently. So, in this sense, contentment in the terms of knowing what you have and uh, understanding that appreciating the fact that you have it is a good thing and uh, I believe that that verse really stood out to me when I was reading this lesson. Okay. Grace, what verse spoke to you? For me, the verse that spoke to me is Luke eleven nineteen through 10. Mm -hmm. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Mm -hmm. And God knows, you know, what we need. He can't, like, if he know, for example, you know, for us humans, we know what we need to survive is food, shelter, and clothing. Mm -hmm. So he cannot deny us of that, or he knows that we will, you know, die. Mm -hmm. So when, even for the homeless people out there, like, God knows how to take care of them. He provides them with food. He provides them with shelter. You know, even if it's not that decent, at least it's, eno it's enough to keep them alive. He provides them with clothing. Everything that we ask for, as long as it is in line with his will, he will give it to us. And he won't give us what we've not asked for. Like the verses that, that are there before says, like which of you, even though you're evil, your son will ask you for an egg and you'll give him a, a scorpion. I mean, we can't do that. So that means that God who loves us infinitely more than our earthly parents do, he can't do that either. He will provide you with absolutely everything that you need. All you have to do is ask. Amen. We'll go to Ashley. The verse that spoke to me was Hebrews 3.12, which says, See to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful and believing heart that turns away from the living God. And belief in this text states that God causes us to depart, that unbelief causes us to depart from God. When we doubt his providence, we tend to seek another way of fulfilling our needs. Therefore, we stop believing and stop trusting. Mm -hmm. okay. And Philippians 4.19 tells us that, and my God will satisfy all your needs according to his riches in glory. That is, God says that whatever we have and whatever we need to have, he is there and he will be there to satisfy us according to his infinite wisdom. Amen, amen. And if I may, you know, it reminds me of a song that, it's kind of like a chorus, it goes like this. Jehovah Jireh, my provider, his grace is sufficient for me, for me, for me. Jehovah Jireh, my provider, his grace is sufficient for me. My God shall supply all my needs according to his riches in glory. He will give his angels charge over me. Jehovah Jireh cares for me, for me, for me. Jehovah Jireh cares for me. Amen, amen. John 6 verse 48 says that I am the bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. The manna that the children of Israel ate in the wilderness that God provided represented Jesus Christ. And God was saying in this verse that even though they ate that bread, the manna, they actually died. But Jesus came to give us everlasting life. So the manna was a symbol of Jesus Christ. I would like to have some closing thoughts from the spirit of prophecy, which Ashley, you can share with us once more. And Maybe the question we'll ask is, it's easy to be like the children of Israel and cave into a grumbling spirit. Mm -hmm. Do we try sometimes to speak positive words and energize other people? Or do we reflect on the things that we say? Because this was some of the things the children of Israel were doing in the wilderness. 
You know, the power of speech manifests in our own lives. When we care, when you complain, grumble all the time, mm -hmm. we never have the spirit of gratitude. And so we don't look forward to living another day. We just grumble when our soul is supposed to sing, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. That's Psalms 103, mm -hmm. verse 1 to 2. Something that comforted me in this, even though it's unhappy campus, they doubted, complained, murmured, and grieved the heart of God. Something that comforted me was that the Spirit of God is grieved when we are anxious. Therefore, the Lord seeks to fulfill our needs. Because when we are anxious, it grieves His Spirit. So the Lord, He brings, us, he brings difficulties to our lives that we may learn to cast his cares upon him, for he cares for us. Because if the Lord knows every spiral, how much more of us? Amen, amen. I believe the story in the wilderness actually gives us a challenge and helps us to understand that we can trust God absolutely and fully. And even when things don't seem right, God can provide a way. When the Israelites thought they did not have any bread in the wilderness, God actually sends manna to them and tells them, here is food. When they were drinking water and thinking that this water is bitter, the waters in, of, that they called mar, God says, put this wood in the water and it actually turns to something that they can drink. And the Israelites are supplied in the right way. God says in Philippians 4 verse 19, that my God shall supply your need according to his riches in glory. So this lesson is teaching us absolutely understand that God is trustworthy. So if we ask the question who we can trust, God is the only one we can trust. We can't trust in anything in the world, only God. And if he has to do something supernatural to provide for us, God will do it as he deems fit. Amen. Before we close, I'd like to invite you all to give your closing thoughts. I'll just read the Father Insight. It says, The humblest and poorest of the disciples of Christ can be a blessing to others. They are not required to weary themselves with anxiety about success. They have only to go forward quietly, doing faithfully the work that God's providence assigns, and their life will not be in vain. And as I see it, what I can take out of here is that God is ready, willing, and set to provide us with that which we need, and we need not worry or fret, for our God is a God who will never forget. Amen. God does not forget. Steve. I'll summarize it in a few words. Mm -hmm. Be calm and trust God. Amen. Grace? For me, I say that God knows what you need. So don't fret when it looks as though it has run out or things are not going to be okay. God saw this situation which you're in even before you were born, and he's going to help you through it. He's going to provide you with what you need. And as the flashlight up or a part of it said, not trusting God is actually a sin. I know it's hard. I know it can be quite hard to trust in God when things are not going right, but just Pray that he gives you the strength to trust in him even when the odds look not good. Amen. God has proven trustworthy in all that we do. And the story of the unhappy campers is actually a symbol of us who live in this world. God has put us in this world. We're like the ones traveling in the wilderness from Egypt to the promised land, symbolizing our journey from earth to heaven, where earth is like Egypt. And heaven is the promised land that God wants to take us to. If we meet, in, we meet with trials in this world where we don't have water or have issues with getting food like the Israelites in the desert, God tells us to still trust in him. So the encouragement for us is let's not be unhappy campers in this world. As we journey from Egypt to the promised land, let us have absolute trust in God because he's faithful in all he does. And if things don't look like they'll come from the earth, God can send down manna from heaven. He'll do something supernatural to provide for us. 
like to invite Steve to close for us with a word of prayer. Let's believe and pray. Our kind and everlasting Master, we thank you once again for giving us a new day and a new Sabbath, O oh God. Father, we have studied your word, we have studied your lesson, and it has made us understand that we should be calm and trust in you, and that we should understand that you are the one who provides for us, and you are the one who cares for us. Father, I pray you to help us cultivate this in our daily lives, and I pray you to be with us every step of the way, guiding us to understand what is good and evil, and enabling us to reach out in you in glory, oh dear Father. Thank you for everything. Uh, help us enjoy the rest of our Sabbath. For this is my humble prayer, believe and trust in, in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Teacher Nico. We'd like to invite you to join us for our lesson next week. And the title will be The Covenant of Love. Have a blessed Sabbath ahead.